<laughs> I feel like that makes Zero. makes things unnecessarily dramatic. The countdown. Oh, we we need more drama on the show. Our audience <laughs> demands drama of us, Matt. All right, fair enough. Hey, do you know what episode this is? I, I don't actually. I've lost count. Fit, I'm going to guess sixty. It's, I'm going to guess that you have a piece of paper on oh, your yeah. desk in front of you. This <laughs> I do, and I was right as well. Unbelievable. That's right. It's the only positive thing that's happened to me today. Do you want to? You want to do the so intro? Far. Or do you want to let me do it? Go for it, Graham. Please. Okay. <laughs> Hello, dearies. Welcome to episode 60 of Undersampled Radio. We have a fantastic show today. We thought Matt was going to be a robot, a, a uh, R&B robot, uh, but it turns out that was a microphone problem and it's sorted out, unfortunately. Mm. I think I can reproduce it. Human, uh, Matt. Yeah, please, try it. you want me to play yeah. with this? Do it. Now we can't hear anything from you. Nope. Okay, it's not going to happen. Anyway, um, Bad week. For, this is the, the only oh, the only news bullet point I have right now. You're on mute, Matt. The, he's trying to talk to me. Uh, the only the only news bullet point we have this week is that it's a bad week in the oil biz. There's a rig on fire. It's a, it's a production platform rather fire in um, down here by me. And there's a little leak in Mississippi Canyon Deepwater Gulf of Mexico. However, we have an interesting bullet point from Matt. Well, I, I want to hear more about these. I, I, I don't really follow a lot of sort of uh, like industry news, I guess, <laughs> because I hadn't heard about either of these incidents. Are they like what's going on? Are they under control or? Yes, what's the both, both incidents are under control. One, I believe, was a, the deep water thing, I believe, was a flow line. They shut the well in and they're fixing it. And the other one is that? actually a really bad deal. Um, seven people were injured and one person died. This is the fire in. Like you, you probably have a, an unusually quaint way of saying Pontchartrain. How does he have to say that? Pontchartrain. Pontchartrain. <laughs> Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, yes. That was the one that injured people. Yes, it was. Unfortunately, there was a cleaning crew out on the platform. They were doing something. We don't know the whole story yet. They were doing something with uh, stripping paraffin. And the thought is that one of the, uh, you know, they use xylene sometimes for doing that type of job. One of these corrosive chemicals was sparked somehow. That must be scary. So they evacuated today and the whole deal? Yep. Oh, wow. Yep. Next. <laughs> I I didn't have a great deal to, uh, to say because I'm just working at the moment, basically, trying to get through a couple of um, well, just one actually uh, job for a client. This is the, the ground penetrating radar stuff we've been working on for a little while. So we've got that going on. And then trying to think about next year, a lot of proposals happening. Um, some of them sort of community related, so related to events and things like that. And some of them are, um, you know, work related. We're, so we get a lot, I was saying to you before the show, we're getting a lot of inquiries about training, um, you know, because we do this Python training course that sort of only uses geoscience data, so logs and seismic and um, other earth science data sets. And um, a, a renewed interest in that, really, I'd say, for the, over the last three months or so. So we're sort of trying to figure out how to get, sort of bring the price down for people because... Uh, what is the price? Is it transparent? Do you tell? Can we can we say on the show? Uh, yeah, it, it it's not as transparent as I'd like it to be. I'd like it to be a sort of one here's price your, fits all. Here's um, your opportunity. Yeah. Spit it out. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it usually works out to be uh, about between six hundred and eight hundred dollars per person per day when we're doing it at a client, for example, right. which is. That's um, Kind of gets up there, but like I was saying to you before the show, you know, when we're traveling from here, and if, if it's multi-day, we kind of need to use two people, two instructors, especially if it's more than eight people in the class. Um, and then there's often extra prep to do because there's some request for some particular bit of content, and it, it adds up, right? It becomes sort of tens of thousands of dollars to do a class, and. Um, it just feels like I'd like more people to experience it, so we're trying to figure out how to do that. I, like we've thought a bit about online and do you hold public do something that way, but courses rather than offer for one company? 
Yeah, yeah, we, we, we've done that a few times. We do them on spec, basically, so book a space. Again, the price gets up there really quickly, right? Because you, then you've got not only like $4,000 worth of travel expenses, you've got to book the space, you've got to feed everybody, um, still the prep and everything like that. You want to have students there, but students are basically, I mean, as far as we're concerned, they're a loss. Like we lose money on student tickets for these things, but you want some students there. So it, it ends up being quite expensive for the professionals who come. And then it's hard to get many of them or enough of them in the room to pay for the whole experience. That's the reality of it. So it's a bit of a bit of a not really a paradox, but something that we're working on. <clears throat> Go on, <laughs> I'm in all ears. You, in case you don't know, Matt lives in the magical fairyland of Nova Scotia. And you could just move. <laughs> <laughs> move to where the action is. Move to Austin like everyone else. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah, sure. Okay. One, one thing that we're trying to do better is sort of when we go somewhere for work, say, to also do a public course when we go there yeah. so that we're there for multiple reasons and then you spread the cost out a little bit. Um, we, we could, we could get, get better at that, but it's a, then it's a bit of a juggle sort of with dates and things. So anyway, that's one of the ongoing joys of trying to scratch a living. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, yeah, you know that story. I only have one bullet point today, which is, uh, that I was denoising some seismic records by using a generative machine learning algorithm. Yeah. Specifically, the supervised algorithm we talked about on the last show called Pix to Pix Image Translation at Work. And um, it works really super well for synthetic data. Yeah. <laughs> but like <me. laughs> but yeah, the reason nice. I wanted to mention it before we, we introduce our guests is because we've had at the past two hackathons two separate teams work on similar problems, eliminating noise of some type from seismic records. And the code is up and running and open and free. So if you want it, send me a message or just visit my GitHub and uh, let it rip. Yeah, it is pretty cool. I, like, I would say to people, go and check out the, well, the easiest bite size, unless you've blogged about it already. Um, no, not yet. You tweeted about it just after we recorded the last show. So a week to 10 days ago, and um, you tweeted a, or I think it was on Twitter, um, yep. a nice little kind of denoised synthetic, and I thought it looked really impressive, so kudos. Check it out or wait for the publication in the CSEG Recorder in January 2018. Hey Matt, why don't yeah. you introduce our guest? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, Sarah Greer is uh, joining us today. She's uh, down at the bottom of the screen if you're watching and uh, we'll talk to her in a second. But um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know Sarah very well at all, so I can't introduce much about her other than to say, like a lot of people, you know, I, I, I put something up on Twitter about, um, about norms because I was doing a blog post on norms a couple of weeks ago, did another one this morning. And uh, uh, Sarah immediately kind of, uh, reached out to me and said, hey, check out this widget I made that sort of demos um, making um, like a Voronoi triangle tiling, but using different um, norms. Uh, so it's a kind of interactive demo. I think you built that in processing. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a neat little language that a lot of artists and sort of, I don't know, uh, what would you say, uh, visual programmers use for sort of experimentation, um, which has also got my curiosity up. So I thought it'd be fun to have her on the show. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, you're in Austin? Yeah, right now. Mm -hmm. Right, and wh what are you doing there? You're a, you're in a, you're a postgrad student, is that right? I'm in under did I Did I lose no. everyone or did we lose Sarah? I just lost Sarah as well. Oh, okay. So we'll uh, tune, tune back <laughs> patiently, patiently waiting for an intro. And uh, okay, so anyway, um, we'll just wait for Sarah to log back in. If she can hear us, we are uh, having some connection issues over there. Um, however, we can go back, Matt. To, um, wait, we have Sarah here again. It looks like she came back. We did. We lost you, Sarah. Okay. Uh, pretty much. <laughs> 
pretty much right when I said, so what's your deal? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, um, uh, so yeah, what is yeah. your deal? <laughs> what, is, what, what are you up to there in Austin? Um, I'm an undergraduate senior uh, studying okay. math and geophysics right now. So finishing up my last year. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. So is that like a double major? Is that what they call a double major? Yeah, it's a double major. All right, so. and that would mean you're in your fourth year mm -hmm. as a senior. Yeah. Very, very cool. So um, it, did you come, you know, was your interest primarily sort of earth science or, you, or was it mathematics from the start? Well, I came in to UT as a geology major and I've always liked computer science and math. Um, so along the way, I kind of found computational science and I, um, ended up adding math as a second major and doing research in the field. So it's kind of been a process to get here. Yeah, right. That's, that's really cool. Um, I, yeah, I, I sort of really rue my lack of um, tenacity at math at the university. I very quick, I, fe I felt like it very quickly shook me off. <laughs> and uh, have you have you found it? fairly okay to kind of keep up with it and has it has it been uh, what kind of experience has it been well I think you have the same experience as a lot of people a lot of my friends um, I think once you realize or for me it's kind of like speaking another language it kind of mm. helps a little bit I found it's I guess I enjoy the um, process of math or learning the um, how things work in that sense that, that math is able to provide. Um, so it's, I mean, I've grown to love math more than I used to. That <laughs> right. <laughs> helps. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, because for me, it was kind of the other way around. <laughs> as soon as I got to university, I kind of grew to hate it. And I had to actually loved it at school. Um, and are there any other um, people kind of around in your cohort? Um, that are, that are kind of in a, on a similar path? Do you have other earth science mathematicians to kind of hang out with and go over problems with? Yeah, well, there's um, one guy in a grade below me, uh, you're below me, who's doing math and geology, actually. But okay. um, so there's, I mean, there are a few people. How about um, the geophysics students? So in my year, I think I'm the most probably computationally or interested in the computational side, mathematics side, than most of my other um, classmates. But I'm not sure about other years. Hmm. Gotcha. Right, how's, right. how's the program set up over there for um, geophysics in particular? Is it um, a physics major that has some geology, or is it a geology major that has some physics? Well, it's more a geology major that has some physics. So we start off, um, the first two years are primarily geology and geophysics are you know, mixed quite quite well. And then after that, we start taking geophysics classes our junior year. Um, so we kind of branch off there. Um, well, kudos to you, because yeah. I'm a math nerd myself. And uh, it's hard to do both of those things simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, I never I mean, finished. You, you what? I never finished my math. I actually had I was enrolled as a as a double major i have like two two classes left for my <laughs> undergraduate math degree Dude. i'm just a slacker i know <laughs> yeah. i don't know what the classes are but um do, and do, how do you like do you find the uh because what one of the things that i sort of drew me back into quantitative stuff after i started my career as a geologist like a pretty much pure geologist was the sort of realization that mathematical geophysicists look at problems in a completely different way from most other earth scientists and um and i i really like that but do you do you find yourself thinking about problems uh, differently from your classmates in, in geology because of your math strength definitely um yeah. so at ut how it's structured is the math department is very much separate from the geology department and geophysics department um, so I feel like I learn a lot of things almost simultaneously between classes, which hmm. my geophysics background helps me in my math classes and my math classes help me with my geophysics uh, classes. Um, so I do look at things a little bit more, I would say computationally or differently than my uh, geophysics classmates do. Well, I mean, by now you've got to be doing 
abstract algebra, advanced calculus, something like that, right? For yeah. Math. Yeah. So, so do you use any of this in, in <laughs> geophysics? Well, I'm I'm doing a lot of um, my math major specialization is in scientific computation. So I do oh, I'm cool. taking a lot of numerical analysis courses, and I have to learn a lot of, let's say, algorithms that you would use for, you know, um, computational math. Cool. So, say for example, I learn in geophysics the high level overview of interpolation, and then in my math classes, I'll learn the low level overview or the low level, um, like how the algorithms work, um, the convergence or the stability. So I guess with my two majors, I'll learn similar things, but on different levels. Excellent. Sounds like a nice symbiosis. And uh, it looks like you had an internship this summer. Yeah. Yeah. What were you doing? Um, I was with Tycom Geomatics, um, which is a company here in Austin. And they, they're kind of a Department of Defense type contractor. So they're kind of on the, um, um, I guess specifically what they do is source signal location. So I was a data ana analysis intern. Um, so I did a lot of uh, MATLAB development, kind of programming, I guess implementing a lot of their file types into viewing things in Google Earth. And I did some things um, for tracking airplanes. So I wrote a few scripts to get ADSB data from airplanes that are traveling over Austin hmm. that are picked up on a Raspberry Pi and uh, processed to see where they are in real time. Ah, that's um, cool. Yeah, it was definitely interesting. What, what did you find? I mean, did you find there was a discrepancy between the two? Um, well, I guess the reason I did or try to get the um, airplane pass was because they're trying to locate you know, different signals, and they're trying to see that's the truth value is the location of the airplane. So hmm. um, I guess that would be up for them to see, uh, use my scripts and see how accurate their uh, methods are. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. uh, that's really interesting. I, yeah. what, like one of the things that strikes me that I, I think it would be, I mean, I, I assume that lots of people have thought about this stuff uh, in other fields, but it, seem, it seems like something we often struggle with in Earth sciences and I can I would have thought in that sort of signal location sort of problem where you've got different pieces of information coming from different modalities, different instruments, um, maybe with different reliability, um, different kind of dimensionality even, and reconciling those to come up with an answer that sort of makes sense that, that it doesn't have all of those dimensions and uncertainties or at least quantifies them, puts them on a map, say, in Google Earth or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, what, you know, th this just seems like something that I, I end up thinking about a lot, but I don't really know where to start mm -hmm. solving a problem like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, what, have, you, have you come across things like that, or um, is, is that something that comes up much in with uh, this source signal location? Well, that's actually my research in, in geophysics is oh, a lot of, perfect. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of data matching. Um, so, for example, one of the uh, one thing I've been working on for a while now is if there are two seismic surveys that were acquired over the same area using different technologies, they'll have, say, different resolution uh, than the other. Um, we want to be able to interpret both or see if we can find different features we like in both data sets. So we can try to match the two data sets um, to make sure that they are aligned and everything and then merge them together. Right. So it's kind of a, a data set that combines the two um, aspects that you like about the initial data set. So I guess in a sense, um, what a lot of the research that I'm doing right now, that's just one example, is uh, related to that, that sort mm. of data matching problem. So with that problem specifically, where you've got these two, essentially the same technology, but they're at different resolutions because they're different vintages or different uh, acquisition geometries or whatever, mm -hmm. it, it can, um, is the upside there that you might actually be able to get better resolution than either of them have from the combined yeah. data set? So in theory, yes. Um, when you have, my screen went black, one second. Oh, we're can still, still here. See me? No, yeah, we can okay. still see you. Yeah. Gotcha. It's back on. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, so, I 
guess I forgot the question. Oh, sorry. So you can go beyond the resolution of each yeah. of the contributing surveys. Yeah. Um, so, so that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So in theory, you have, let's say, one data set that's from, I don't know, 10 to 60 hertz, and another one that's from maybe 40 to 150 hertz, which is kind of similar to the data set I'm working with. You can merge the two together, and in theory, or in practice, actually, your bandwidth is a combination of these two initial images. So it's higher resolution uh, than both the initial data sets. And how do you do that if you have different acquisition geometries? So a lot of the process for this is trying to align them and merge them. Um, so especially in three dimensions, one of the three dimensional data sets I'm working with are wired like on entirely separate grids and one of them's really spatially dense than the others. So of course you have to make some sort of sacrifice of whether to interpolate or you know, undersample um, in order to align them. And then after spatially aligning them, you have to temporally align them um, as well. Yeah, right. So I didn't, I, I couldn't get this from uh, your CV. Is this yeah. done in a uh, seismic processing setting? Are you starting with shot records or is this like stack data that you're matching stack data on? Well, so right now it's it's post stack data. Um, That's a much bigger in, problem. <laughs> in theory, it could be done pre stack, might be. Well, so I. Like merging surveys is common mm -hmm. practice. I've done this many times where, mm -hmm. I mean, if you've got, you know, reliable observer nodes or geometries or whatever, then you can you can do this matching deterministically. But I assume mm -hmm. that your process is more of a statistical methodology. Mm -hmm. So tell us a bit about how you go about like reconciling A, your spatial dimensions, and then B, your temporal dimension. Well, spatial dimension is really uh, pretty basic. Um, so, for example, in the one data set I'm working with, one volume is very, very dense, and the other one is a lot less dense. Um, so instead of interpolating, I just removed the more dense samples, um, which we're losing information, but if we interpolated, we might, you know, introduce artificial information. Um, so after, I guess, spatial aligning, we align temporally, and I guess, before I start on that, for uh, data matching, you can view data matching as a problem as three separate operations. Um, the first one being um, accounting for amplitudes or weighting in um, the temporal domain, so making sure at each point that the amplitudes are, are relative to each other. Then also accounting for frequency variations or filtering data sets to make sure that at each point they have um, similar frequency content, which can be thought of as um, scaling but done in the, the frequency domain instead of the time domain as uh, scaling is regularly done. And then finally there's accounting for time shifts or warping where you align reflections between each other to make sure that they're aligned. Um, so these three main operations can be done in um, different orders and they're, it's non-commutative so if you smooth first and then scale it's different from scaling and then smoothing. So you kind of have to find a balance in order to make sure that you're, um, after you've applied these operations, the two data sets match quite well. Um, so what I did in this um, matching data sets of different resolutions is I first accounted for frequency content because you know that's the most stark difference between the two data sets is there a difference in frequencies. Right. And um, I specifically look at non-stationary um, differences in frequencies. So I use um, local frequency, which is an attribute that kind of, it's a time dependent frequency attribute. Um, and the reason you look kind of at non-stationary variations is because when you're aligning data sets, you're trying to compare each point on your data set to each other point on your data set, kind of in a point by point or a general neighborhood, I guess. Um, so you want to make sure that at each specific point, the information is aligned. So you couldn't apply or you could apply, but it probably wouldn't work as well. Uh, one operation or a, a stationary operation to the entire data set, because that wouldn't account for non-stationary variations. Um, so usually, or what I do is the first step is non-stationary smoothing, which is trying to find however many samples to smooth over in the higher frequency or higher resolution image to balance the spectral content or frequencies with the lower frequency uh, image. And that's done first primarily because 
it's really difficult to compare time shifts between data sets if they have different frequency content. So if you have yeah. one trace that's really low frequency, you can't really find the, this analogous information in the opposite trace, especially for a lot of the matching algorithms. Um, so then after frequencies are accounted for, I then try to account for amplitude variations by finding you know, the weight that would match the amplitudes of one image to the other. Um, and after that, you can find a time shift using algorithms like um, dynamic time warping. I specifically use uh, local similarity scanning um, to find what shift needs to be applied to one image to align with the other to make sure that all the reflections um, are correctly aligned. So I guess these are the three primary steps that you can do to match the two data sets. Do you output um, some sort of velocity perturbation field as you as you do your time stretching? Well, you end up with something like very similar to semblance. Yeah. Um, local similarity looks, I mean, it's so kind of, I guess. <laughs> um, hmm. Now, would, uh, I guess with the highly regular geometry of seismic, this is real data, I assume, it's not field, yeah. uh, not a model. Um, mm -hmm. You don't run into this, but one thing that we're finding with uh, with GPR data is that, um, you know, let's say you, you take two parallel transects, there's no, well, there's not even no guarantee, but basically there's no way of ensuring that the traces line up because mm -hmm. it's just using a little wheel on the cart and things get buggered up basically. You can't, do you know what I mean? You can't reconcile the two lines to say if you wanted to put them into a 3D because um, you don't really know the exact location of every trace. So I've been wondering about doing what, something similar to what you're talking about but in the other sort of dimension actually moving mm -hmm. things around along the line <laughs> yeah. uh, but I guess the same kind of thing might work, right? I mean, I suppose. I guess that would be more almost interpolating if you wanted to a regular grid though, right? Yeah, except some of the data is actually in the wrong place. Right. Yeah. So it's it's so it kind of needs to be put back, like squeezed in some places and stretched in mm -hmm. others to account mm -hmm. for this weird um, Sort of sloppy acquisition. Acquisition, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but we have quite a lot of parallel lines, so there's, mm -hmm. there's some assumption, I guess, that there's some features that be smoothly varying across the lines. I guess that's what your assumption depends on: is some sort of way to match stuff from one thing to the next. Yeah. Have you guys, either of you, considered using the sort of gigapixel image processing algorithms? You know, for like image mosaicing, like oh, stitching, because right. mm, it's, it's the same. Like it's the same. It's a similar problem. Yeah. No, I haven't thought of that. That. All right, hack it up, baby. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And then, so then, one other note I had in the old noggin here, as you were talking, is: Can you add back in filtered frequencies? So, like. If you take a high frequency data set, can you reconstitute some of that information in the rectified data set? Yeah, so that's one of the processes. Um, I guess after matching them, we find this time shift, and you usually reapply it to the initial um, high resolution data set. So, in theory, you're not losing any frequencies. Uh, the only reason you're removing those frequencies is so you can find the, the matching um, I see. time shift. So, then after you have these two aligned, um, spatially and temporally data sets, we merge them together um, using least squares inversion. So in the end, you're not losing any frequency content. Cool. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cunning. So, hmm. And I guess, the, so the other, the other uh, extension, I guess, of the problem that I wonder about is what, you know, could you use uh, a similar approach to integrate seismic data set with, well, for a start, something less um, less like a surface uh, array or um, survey, like a crosswell survey, for example, mm -hmm. or, or 
to go even further, you know, something completely different like gravity or magnetic um, survey? Well, I mean, you could match data of different types. Um, I guess kind of like well ties and seismic, right? It would be. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, That's you good can method. use. Yeah. You can use similar methods. Um, there's actually someone in our research group right now that's doing um, matching well ties to seismic semi automatically using local similarity scanning as a similar uh, way to that. Okay, that's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Who's that? Uh, Sean Bader. He's a master's student. Okay, cool. Uh, we should track him down. I'm, I'm very interested in well tying, and I know I've said it on the program before, but I feel like well tying is an unsolved problem of exploration geophysics because mm -hmm. every, but I feel like pretty much every single person you talk to does it in a different way. Mm -hmm. It's almost like there's as many workflows as there are explorationists. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I don't think that's entirely good because I'm pretty sure that, I don't know what per percentage, but let's say at least a quarter of those ways are highly erroneous. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I'd, I'd go so far as to say it might even be, uh, you know, half of them, um, or at least, if not erroneous, non-optimal. Mm -hmm. um, like, and it's and people have been hacking on automatic well tying for quite a while. No, no one seems to have figured that out quite yet. Blows me away. Such a fundamental, like, basic piece of the whole puzzle, and we don't really know how to do it properly. Mm -hmm. or, so or, or, I, if not properly, then let me change that to because uh, I don't want to make it sound like my well ties are perfect. But I mean, we don't know how to be <laughs> consistent and express the level of uncertainty that we have about the result that we've got and repeatable and kind of reproducible from one individual to the next. Like those are all unsolved. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why Sean's doing um, Mattis's project. Um, He's yeah. mentioning similar things. Had a few conversations about that with him. It's brave because, like I say, I I don't know what it is about the workflow that's so resistant to kind of codification, mm -hmm. but there's something about it that's yeah. I don't well not impossible, but what's it's not intractable, but it's barely tractable. Semi tractable. Like, <laughs> micro tractable. <laughs> Anyway, do you want to ask the uh, the uh, uncertainty question, Matt, or should I? Yeah, okay, okay, you ask it just to make sure that. How do we the question you're thinking of? <laughs> oh, I see. I was just going to say, how how do you quantify uncertainty in your seismic matching experiment? Um, well, right now that's quite a bit of a problem um, <gasps> because, <laughs> in a sense, because the frequency overlap, um, you know, that you want to to match signal of the same frequency, right? You need to make sure that they have, um, and the overlap in our data right now is quite, or one of the data sets we're working right now is quite narrow. So um, that is uh, difficult. I guess we look at the um, residual between the smoothed higher, um, or the smooth, the two images before and after balancing and mm. you know try to minimize that, obviously. Um, as a data matching problem, but as far as quantifying goes, I guess we could take some sort of norm measurement, but it, it's it's a little bit of a manual process to make sure that they are aligned. Yeah, I wonder if you could if you could tune tune your process there as, as like an optimization problem. Because you do have some quantitative residual information, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. It'd be cool to design the pipe, and maybe you already do this. Design the pipeline in a in a reproducible way that's like end to end, and mm -hmm. then tune those. I don't want to use the keyword hyperparameters, but tune the tune the parameters using an optimization algorithm. Huh. I guess right now um, the workflow is done in Madagascar, so it is similar. Yeah, um, you could definitely do it. Yeah. Go through. So I might. So what about Madagascar? About How do you like it? Well, I do like it a lot. Um, so I use it um, for, for pretty much everything I've been working on. And it's hmm. it's great because it's a lot of the, um, there are a lot of papers that are included. So they're reproducible papers that are included within Madagascar. Um, so I've actually learned quite a bit by just reproducing 
those papers went within Madagascar and changing parameters and you know seeing how things work. So if you have, let's say you're reading a paper and you see that it is reproducible, you can go and get the exact code and run it and see exactly step by step how, say in a paper, the figures are generated or um, how different changes could affect um, the result. So it's really, I think that's probably one of the best ways that I've learned um, in, I mean, I guess I started research in geophysics before I took my first geophysics course. Um, so that was one of the really helpful methods for me is to kind of reproduce and tinker with Madagascar. And it's your, it's pretty easy to do. It's, you know, it's an open source software package um, that allows you to, to experiment and learn from it and verify results. Yeah. And can you go knock on Sergei Fermel's door with uh, something weird going on or yeah. is, he, is he a useful resource? Yeah, definitely. He's my advisor. Um, All right. I'm working with, yeah. Um, so he's definitely helpful. He's helped me quite a bit over yeah. the I guess, year and a half ish. I've worked with him. That's great. And mm -hmm. have you come across anything like the, the roof usability things? It, you know, really interesting. And I think, you know, we're still in the middle of a bit of a reproducibility crisis in geophysics. Mm -hmm. And um, have you come across things in your research where you're sort of trying to implement something, some you know, quote unquote, standard thing, but you've basically had to re-implement it from scratch because you can't find any other, any, anybody else's implementation. Mm -hmm. that... Well, from, from what I've done now, I've, you know, gone to the SCG um, and I've seen some talks and I've wanted to, you know, mess with their, their stuff. Um, I've actually found with, you know, sufficient Googling, um, <laughs> similar methods in Madagascar that I could, you know, manipulate well enough um, right. to get a similar result. So, um, I haven't run into that problem yet because I guess Madagascar is so well uh, got a lot of examples. Um, yeah. But I guess if some, if there are papers that you know don't um, haven't been followed up in, in Madagascar or a similar package like that, it might be difficult to say reproduce or verify or anything. Um, you know, if you want to borrow, it. if you want to borrow my reproducibility stamp, you can. Yes, <laughs> I need that on everything. <laughs> Seriously, That's really cool. <laughs> I designed a reproducibility stamp for Matt. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> you that probably don't even remember Matt. What does it say? Reproducible or yes. unreproducible? Uh, I don't remember actually. <laughs> Quite like an unreproducible one that you could just <laughs> you could stamp it on preprints and send them back to the authors. Need more yeah. code. <laughs> yeah. uh -uh. <laughs> no, I think that I, it's amazing, and I, I use Madagascar a lot myself. I, mm -hmm. uh, I have a great love of uh, not just reproducible research, but reproducible ex coding experiments, because that's how I, I learned to yeah. actually write code. Um, unlike you, who have taken courses in <clears throat> Fortran and MATLAB. <laughs> yes. I just I, I did it all sort of myself. Are, are you serious? <laughs> More trend. Uh oh! Whoa! What uh oh! She cut out. She cut out again. Uh -oh. oh, she's back. You're back. You're back. Is it good? Okay. So it's called Introduction to Programming in Fortran and MATLAB, but we really only talked about MATLAB, you know. So it's oh, good. <laughs> a little bit <laughs> relieving, but you know, it's good to know. A, I'm yes, upset, so. but <laughs> yeah. So there is one other th note on these show notes that I wanted to yeah. talk about, which is the Raspberry Pi home server thing. That's yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. so, so your your website is actually running on a Pi. Yeah, it's running on a Raspberry Pi in my parents' house, actually, in Oregon. Um, yeah, so I guess I host, for a while now, I've had a, a server in different locations. And right now it's in. Oregon, but for I used to host just plain class notes and everything on it that my oh, cool. uh, you know, friends could access and I could access. And right now, um, so I live in like student housing. So in my network, you're not allowed to port forward or open your ports up. So you can't have a server that's outside accessible outside of the network mm -hmm. um, here. So what I do is I, you know, kind of go around that rule by having the one ultimate hack. 
Yeah, I have one in Oregon, and then I open my ports from here. I remote connect to the one in Oregon, so whenever I need to access my um, computer here locally or anything, I can go to um, or connect to the one in Oregon, and then that has a, a, a pipe back here. Um, so it's, I guess, a way to get around network blocking. <laughs> For all of the lawyers and politicians who are listening to this show, that's called the cloud, folks. <laughs> awesome. I, I, I'm, I dig it. Doing the uh, hardware and software combination hack is always mm -hmm. a fascinating endeavor. Yeah. Uh, Matt, take it away for a sec. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I, I really like sort of practical solutions like that too. But it, it, the, I mean, I guess your solution doesn't probably, it wouldn't contravene any rules where you are, right? Because oh, I don't believe so. it's your hardware and it's sitting out on the internet. Mm -hmm. but, um, but it's amazing how often, you know, supposedly security concerned rules about access and so on actually have a completely sort of uh, contrary like unintended consequences of people just doing even less secure even more horrendous things to get around the fact that you know they can't let's say install software on the computer so they sort of bring a computer from home that they can install software on and put mm -hmm. the company's data on there instead. yeah you know, that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But it's, yeah, it's just getting things done, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, do you, do you hack around much at all with, uh, I don't know, microcontrollers or any other kind of mini computers? Well, I have, I guess, inspired by my internship this past summer. I've been working with yeah. a little bit of um, software, fine radio um, antennas yeah. and stuff recently. So. Um, there are a few programs you can run on a Linux computer that you can, you know, look at all the, the frequency spectrum, find where there's any you know, coherent signal and listen in or... Uh, from the Wi-Fi antenna? No, from, I guess... From anything? Yeah, I have a few antennas. Oh. So what, you, it's cool. <laughs> what do you do? You yeah. plug them into the microphone port or something? What, yeah, what? well, there's... Let me see if I can get it here. There's a little RTL SDR adapter and Easy for you to RTL is the, it's the brand and then SDR stands for software defined radio. I'm trying to see if I can get mine out. I don't know where exactly it is. Um, you have you can use like coax cables and okay. I have rabbit ear antennas here. Um, <laughs> I can't find the dongle at the moment. I, found it. I love that you have a box of random. <laughs> I do. I thing. have a pie here too. It's slightly out of out of frame, but That's good. um, it looks like this. And okay. Oh, yeah. Ah, right. Yeah, and you can plug it in uh, to a coax cable, and then connect it to different antennas, and you know, kind of experiment. Can you oh, link us? In the in the show notes, not necessarily now, but when we're done or whatever. Can yeah. You, can you put a link to the software in the show notes? Yeah, we'll do. Yeah. That'd be awesome. It'd be fun to play with it. Mm -hmm. It's definitely been uh, interesting to tinker with that. Yeah. Right. Um, software defined radio. Seems yeah. like software defined is a bit of a buzzword, isn't it, at the moment? Yeah. <laughs> software defined storage and this and that. Um, interesting. Well. Uh, that's cool. That sounds like you've got a really fun research project, and you've got obviously one of the most awesome people in geophysics as your advisor, which uh, must help. Uh, we, yeah, must get, we must get him on the show someday. <laughs> were we just talking about having Sergey on the show? Actually? Yeah, we were. Yeah, <laughs> let's make it happen. Why did that come up? Because he's awesome. Well, I thought there was some specific reason, though. I can't remember. I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> Um, hey, uh, Sarah, what are you reading at the moment? <laughs> well, you know, as a student, uh, a lot of books, a lot of textbooks. Um, <laughs> I think I put in the show notes. I don't remember which books I put. You put numerical <laughs> you optimization, just, uh, your favorite ones. Yeah, I put my favorite ones. I have. Are you a paper book person? Right here. Yes, I cannot okay. easily use. Look at look at Sarah's cat in the background. <laughs> can we have, wait, can oh, we have yeah. another shot of your cat? Yeah. 
so if you're if you're listening to this as a podcast, you immediately need to go watch the video because there is a this is the cutest episode we've ever done. <laughs> yeah, he likes to sleep there. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he knows you're uh, acknowledging him, I guess. Yeah, right. Good <laughs> kitty. Check me out. Yeah. Check me out. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, so back to numerical optimization. <laughs> yeah. I guess I have this. I've been reading it. Oh my goodness. For... That looks like a. It's hefty. actually a really good book. I've yeah? I came with no knowledge of numerical optimization, and I've read <laughs> quite a bit of it, and now I think. It's pretty well done for someone who doesn't have much experience in the field. Um, well, I'm telling you, your master's project should be the optimization experiment to, to um, <laughs> you know, perform the ultimate, the optimized version of the seismic matching. Yeah, could do that. What yeah, page so. is the first equation on? That's my measure of... <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Um, my, all right, my guess is I, I, I. <laughs> it's going to be on Roman numeral. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> page three, actually. Oh. Yeah, well, you, you were page... on really time. <laughs> That's an example, so. Nah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, Matt, how about you? What are you reading? I'm also reading a textbook. Uh, it's called Grand Penetrating Radar, I think, or maybe an introduction to Grand Penetrating Radar by David Daniels, which seems to be the kind of classic GPR book. It's fairly Don't miss dense, it. but yeah, I, you know, it, it's got a, like whole sections on mine detection, um, utilities, blah, blah, blah. So I'm into utilities, right? So it's very good. Very, it's got me a long way pretty quickly. Cool. I, I wanted to ask uh, Sarah though, before we yes. leave the whole sort of numerical area and books, um, you said you're reading a couple of linear algebra books. Uh, could you, like, what's the best linear algebra book out there? Oh, oh yeah, gosh. good question. Um, well, the book, I guess as far as an intro book, um, the textbook I had was pretty good. I don't know if it would be good to take without taking a class with it, but hmm. the one I, I have right now is kind of a second level linear algebra book, and it's really readable. Okay, um, that's a good start. It's a textbook. Um, applied linear algebra. The decoupling principle. Yeah, so it's hmm. it's a lot of systems of equations that are obviously coupled by the title name and kind of ways to decouple them and applications of that. But it's really like I could I don't skip class, but I could skip class and read the book and probably be fine. It's it's really well done. Um, Sarah, your parents aren't watching. You can tell us he's skipping. <laughs> I actually just came from that class before this show, so. <laughs> Was it a good one? <laughs> a yeah. classic. Yeah. Okay. Always. <laughs> well, I am not reading anything that has any what? substance. Oh. Mm. Um, I have finally busted out into the into the back into the world of science fiction. I've been okay. trying to do this for months, and I finally made it. I read a book called Demon, uh, spelled like with an A, like the computer yeah. demon software. You sure that's um, not a computing book? No, it's a, it's a book of intrigue and thrills. It's pretty good. It's it's uh, it's a quick read. It's a one day read, but it's fun. And then there's a sequel called Freedom. And the book the books are by Daniel Suarez, and uh, they're fun. If you're into um, you know like sci-fi books that have a lot of computery junk, um, go for it. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I don't know. Need to think about my reading list again. It's it's devolved back into a pile of textbooks waiting to be read. I need, I need something else. Shame on you. I know it's you know can barely keep up basically. But hey, Matt, <laughs> I came up with one while we were talking. Hey, Matt, <laughs> what is it? How many of your Twitter friends are your actual friends in real life? Wow, IRL. that's a really that's a really great question. Um. Like, well, what I, I, you know, I mean, Twitter is real life. <laughs> what? You know, okay, what, I'll take that as an answer. Mean, how many times do I have to have met someone? Once. In person, I have to have met them once in person. Or on video call. Yeah, oh, okay, well, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's like at least a quarter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you got a lot of friends, man. Yeah, yeah. 
Hey, Sarah, thanks for coming on the show. It was fun. Yeah, thank yeah thanks you. for having me. It's nice being here. Yeah, it's really fun talking. See you, audience people, next week on Undersampled Radio, the edition where Matt runs the Undersampled Radio account because my computers are going to be in Texas. Bye-bye.